Hi and welcome to another episode of Showcase coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Whimsical, charming and romantic. Later in the show, we'll talk about the life and work of Russian composer Tchaikovsky, whose very music embodies all those ideas. And we'll travel to a bookshop in Portugal that few people have heard of that just might have been the inspiration for a famous magic school. But first... Red Carpet Redux, the Hollywood Film Awards officially kickstart the industry's trophy season. All the names you know and all the millions they're worth. Sotheby's and Christie's are getting ready for their autumn sale. Art auction season has arrived, and if one thing is certain, the banging of a hammer followed by a shouted sold likely means record-breaking sales. And this year, auction houses worldwide are predicting their collections will break sales records. And while some of us take deep sighs knowing we'll never own something priceless, those who can can't wait to jump in. Eight million dollars, that's 25 million dollars. Bear and policeman, that's only a six million. Oh, and don't forget the Richter piece. Now that is supposed to fetch about 30 million dollars. What's this? Oh, it's just the busiest time of the year for auction houses. The time they're all waiting for, the autumn auctions. Auction giants like Sotheby's and Christie's are starting to roll out their offerings for this fall season. And they include the likes of Picasso, Bacon, Van Gogh and David Hockney. Going under the hammer are artworks that range from contemporary to impressionism and modernism. Sure, we have an extraordinary sale this season, 65 lots in total, low estimate in excess of $276 million. And the sale is really highlighted by a number of works coming to market for the very first time and fantastic collections. The collection of David Teeger, a private European collection of four works by Jean-Michel Basquiat, and a number of museums that are selling with Sotheby's, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and the George O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe, just to name two. Some of the pieces are going on sale for the first time. And organizers say this year with the demand for art on the rise, business is booming. The market is incredibly strong. I mean, in addition to our contemporary art evening auctions worldwide, which are obviously the marquee sales of the year, we've seen extraordinary depth of bidding and results in our mid-season sales, in our Hong Kong sales, in our day sales. The market shows an extraordinary depth of bidding and participation from all around the world. And we've seen record interest and, and really record demand. Unfortunately, this time, there's no Banksy pieces up for grabs or shredding for that matter. So don't expect anything too exciting. But still, while some of us continue to debate who exactly art is for, Sotheby's and Christie's are counting on pulling in millions from those who know owning art is definitely for them. So what exactly makes David Hockney's portrait of an artist pull with two figures painting so valuable? To answer that, let's speak to the art business reporter at Artnet News, Tim Schneider. Thank you so much for being with us today, Tim. Now, this painting is expected to break records uh, at the auction that is set to be held at Christie's. What do you think is going to go down? Well, the way that the big evening auctions in New York in May and November go now, um, the houses really don't put up these major paintings unless they're essentially certain that they've already got a buyer ready and waiting to pay the amount of money that they're putting on the estimate or more. So even though we're, we're now talking about this painting as if it could become the, uh, the record for a living artist, it essentially probably already is and we just don't know it. So how much do you think that this painting is actually going to be sold for? Well, it's hard to say what the final number is going to end up being. Christie's right now has it estimated in the range of 
eighty million dollars, which is about twenty five percent more than what the previous record for a living artist is right now, um, which would be Jeff Koons' Balloon Dog Orange at fifty eight point four million dollars. Ooh, that is a hefty amount. Now, uh, Tim, tell me a bit about the story behind this painting. Sure. So. Hockney is a British artist who moved to Los Angeles uh, many decades ago, and he's always been fascinated by the idea of pools, um, partially because he says that in the UK, where he's from, uh, pools were not something, they were, they were a huge luxury. And then when he moved to Los Angeles, everybody had one. So they were just this very mundane part of life that um, he previously saw something really special. But um, this painting in particular it combines two of his major motifs, um, pools and portraits. And to get both of them together in one painting is really special. And so this painting is something that has been out there, um, I think really the, the uh, apple of, of several auction houses eye for a long time. And so the fact that the, the Christie's has managed to consign it for the sale is a big deal. Well, Hockney, uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually created this painting. Uh, but destroyed it and then recreated it later on. Why exactly did he do that? What was the reason behind destroying what he first created? Well, artists can be volatile personalities, and um, this painting in particular has a lot of sort of personal meaning tied up in it. The figure that's on the right-hand side of the portrait is um, a student named Peter Schlesinger that he had a five-year affair with. Um, but the original painting that he started, as you said, was, um, was begun in 1971. He worked on it for a pretty dedicated period of time and then ended up destroying it and reinvigorated, came back into it a year later for a show that he had at the Andre Emmerich Gallery in New York, which was um, a major thing at the time and uh, really kind of worked a massive amount. Um, like he was working 18 hours a day for two weeks to finish this painting in time for the show and it came out and it's now regarded as basically one of his masterpieces. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of masterpieces, there are going to be other works that will be uh, sold at auction, including works uh, from Jean-Michel Basquiat. What makes this specific painting so much more valuable than the other ones that will be sold? Well, the way that the art market works, it's really sort of a mixture of storytelling and what else is happening among the other aspects of the art world. Um, Hockney was the subject of a major traveling retrospective that was just up last year that um, started at the Tate and then went to the Pompidou and then ended at the Met uh, earlier this year. Um, this painting was the the painting that was used as the cover for the catalog for that sale. It's the most reproduced and most exhibited painting in Hockney's entire body of work. And um, again, it, it really combines those two elements that he's known for, the portraiture and pools. And so when you combine all of those things together, along with the fact that there has been a lot of activity in his market over the course of the past few years. Now, Tim, would you consider uh, David Hockney to be one of the most, you know, valued artists of the 20th century? Definitely. He has really been on the ascent lately. Um, at Artnet, we did a, uh, our, our first market report earlier this year. Um, over the first half of the year, auction results during that time, um, David Hockney was the fourth most valuable contemporary painter at that point. He, his, his results at auction had already accumulated about $77 million, and that is already almost double what he did in all of 2016. So not only is he more valuable um, than he's ever been, he's really kind of on this upswing where he's, he's going to be somebody that we remember and talk about in the market for a really long time. Well, Tim, I'm really curious to see how the uh, auction will play out uh, in mid-November. Thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase. All right, thank you so much. The Hollywood Film Awards were recently handed out, and it's likely that those who took home a trophy will likely be up for an Oscar. But is the glamorous ceremony just another excuse to promote the same high-concept films or does it actually bring a fresh perspective into the well-established awards machine? 
For more than 20 years, the Hollywood Film Awards established itself as the first serious stop on the way to the Academy Awards. Some claim the event is simply an extension of the Tinseltown PR machine, saying its only purpose is to sell more movie tickets. But there is one important factor that distinguishes the ceremony from other ones. The voters who decide the winners have in the past included directors like Quentin Tarantino, Penny Marshall and Norman Jewison. And the fact that this year those casting a vote come from different ethnic and storytelling backgrounds is reflected in this year's choices. I met a girl, I fell in love and I want to marry her. You're Nicholas Young. The prestigious Breakout Ensemble Award was handed to Crazy Rich Asians this year. Given its all-Asian lead cast, the win is considered a triumph for multiracial portrayal on screen. And it's being said the win came due to more Asian-American industry workers voicing their concerns for ethnic diversity. She can't know I was over here. I The Hollywood Film Award itself was not given to an Oscar bait feature, but to the comic book adaptation of Black Panther. Again, news outlets say the votes of African-American filmmakers who recently found themselves in a more empowering position allowed for this black power triumph. But it should be also noted that there are also those who think the winners are directly linked to how much they brought in at the box office. The vehicle's not safe. And it's no secret that at the ceremony, the main laurels were handed out to the already Oscar favorite films. Neil Armstrong's Apollo mission biopic, First Man, is one such feature which landed the man who helmed it, Damien Chazelle, the Hollywood Director Award. Chazelle already owns the biggest awards the industry has to offer, including an Oscar for La La Land. And he is expected to repeat the same success in March. Looking at it from that point of view, it could be argued that the Hollywood Film Awards, while allowed to exist on their own, has an umbilical cord that is still tightly tied to the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Still to come on Showcase, leaping into the well-known. We'll look back at Tchaikovsky's influence on the world of music and dance on the anniversary of the Russian composer's death. And reading between the lines, why people think this Portuguese bookstore may have been the inspiration for Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Underrated or overrated, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky has always been a controversial artist. Some criticize the 19th century Russian composer for making music just to please contemporary audiences, while others hail him as a musical genius. He may or may not be, but his works are among the most popular in the classical repertoire. Now we take a look back at his legacy on the anniversary of his death. Well, let's delve a bit more into the life and career of Russian composer Tchaikovsky with our next guest, John Suchet. He is the author of a book titled Tchaikovsky, 
the man revealed. Thank you so much for being with us today, John. Now, tell me why Tchaikovsky was able to have such a huge impact on the Western music landscape. First and foremost, I believe he was the greatest melodist who ever lived. He simply wrote unforgettable melodies. It doesn't matter what the piece of music was, whether it was a piano concerto or a symphony or a string quartet or whatever, or a ballet like Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty. He simply couldn't stop the melodies coming. And they're melodies that today we can hum any one of a dozen melodies. So instantly popular. And his music with melodies like that will live for all time. It will indeed, um, but not everyone loved his music so much back then, so much so that a lot of his uh, mentors made him go back to revise his compositions, didn't they? That's very true. Um, when he was a music student at the St. Petersburg Conservatoire, almost everything he wrote was criticized. And then when he became a professional composer, um, his first piano concerto, for instance, which we know today as one of the greatest ever composed, was rubbished by one of his colleagues who said, you've got to rewrite it from start to finish. His violin concerto was described as music that stinks to the ear. And yet to us, it's one of the greatest ever written. And what I think is perhaps most interesting of all is he was critical of his own music. He took the criticism to heart. It deeply hurt him when other people criticized him. But he said, they're right, they're right. My music is no good. And he tried. He kept rewriting some of his stuff. In fact, he had less faith in his music than we have today. Unfortunately, it was like that. Um, now... Tchaikovsky didn't immediately rise to stardom. Tell me about some of the people who helped him uh, get to where he did back then. Well, he began his life as a musician, as a student at the St. Petersburg Conservatoire, where, as I've said, uh, more senior people there criticized everything he did. He then uh, graduated from there and became a teacher and professor at the Conservatoire in Moscow. There they were a little bit more amenable to him because by then he'd started composing symphonies, his first string quartet had been composed, and they started to take him seriously and promote his work. And of course, he lived um, in an era of great composers in Russia at that time. One thinks of Glinka, Rimsky-Korsakov, um, these great composers who knew about him and he knew about them and they encouraged each other. But they were quite critical of him because he was was breaking new ground and they wanted someone more traditional so he found it hard to get his music heard and the fact that he was able to add a lot of meaning and depth into his compositions was also something that attracted a lot a wide audience compared to the then very famous you know flashy and bombastic style of music it's true, and when he started to compose ballets, which is really perhaps what we know him best for, in particular, he composed what was to become the best love ballet ever written by anyone, Swan Lake. And yet, to begin with, it wasn't immediately accepted. The same was true of his late ballet Sleeping Beauty. The same was true of The Nutcracker, which we hear every Christmas here in London and indeed around the world. But the performances initially were not a success because Tchaikovsky was breaking new ground here. And in fact, it's true to say that, sadly, he died on this day, 125 years ago, at the young age of just 53, and he didn't live to see his works become as successful as we know today that they are. Mm -hmm. Now, John, tell me about the role that his parents played uh, in the growth of him as becoming a composer and throughout his career. Well, his mother, not at all. He absolutely adored his mother. He had a frosty relationship with his father, but he adored his mother. And she died when he was just 14 years of age. And he was devastated. And on that day, the anniversary of her death, for the rest of his life, he would note in his diary, on this day, my beloved mother died, or worse to that effect. And his father was determined that he would become a lawyer. 
and put him into the School of Jurisprudence in St. Petersburg. However, when he uh, was 18 years of age, his father relented and said, all right, you can apply to the St. Petersburg Conservatory of Music, which he did, and he was accepted. And he was then on his path to becoming a musician. But neither of his parents played a particularly large part in that. And his father never really understood how he was making a living as a musician. So we don't owe a lot to his parents. Now tell me how you see the future of Tchaikovsky's legacy. Oh, assured. I mean, the great names of composing for him, for Tchaikovsky, the greatest name in music was Mozart. He described Mozart as the Christ of music. And we have names like Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Mendelssohn, Brahms, great names of 19th century music. But I believe the greatest melodist of them all, as I said at the beginning of this interview, the man who could write more natural melodies than any other was Tchaikovsky. And I haven't mentioned perhaps his most popular piece of music ever, the 1812 Overture. It's played all the time with fireworks and cannon. Everybody knows Tchaikovsky's music. It will truly live for as long as music is played. It will indeed. John Suchet, thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase and remembering the greatest composer of all time, Tchaikovsky. Thank you very much. Portuguese brothers Jose and Antonio Lello wanted to create a temple as an ode to the arts. So in 1906, they founded Lello, now considered to be one of the most beautiful bookstores in the world, not least because of a magnificent red staircase in the middle of the shop. But in addition to being an architectural gem, it's also become a magnet for attracting fans of a certain bespeckled young wizard. Each morning at 8 a.m., people in the Portuguese city of Porto form a long queue outside 144 Carmelita Street. And they have only one reason. For Harry Potter, because the um, author of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, I think she was inspired for Harry Potter, Harry, Harry Potter books here in the store. So that's why we wanted to come and see what inspired her. And all the bars surrounds this magnificent red staircase. The fans think this staircase is similar to the moving staircases of Hogwarts. Author J.K. Rowling. Author J.K. Rowling did live in Porto for two and a half years. She might have visited us, but we can't confirm that because back then she was not a public figure. She was just an English teacher living in town. É provável que ela tenha frequentado o espaço. The fans don't really care if the legend is true or not, or waiting for over an hour to get inside. At 9:30 a.m., the door finally opens. Bianca and her boyfriend are second in line and have the place almost to themselves. Beautiful, beautiful. It's amazing, yeah. the architecture. Unbelievable. <laughs> I can imagine that it's inspiring. Wow. And the ceiling up there yeah. is so high and I love that there's a hole here so you can see straight up to the ceiling which yeah. is super high, wow. The visitors quickly take over the 185 square meters. In the peak season, there are around 3,700 people a day. In the past few years, the city of Porto was discovered by tourists and Lelo became one of the most visited places around here. This is the picture of Lelo's grand opening in 1906. Its founders perhaps wouldn't have foreseen the kind of place it would become. As a solution to the crowds, we created a voucher system in 2015. People pay 5 euros to go inside, but this amount is deducted when they buy a book. After introducing the voucher system, our sales grew exponentially. In 2015, we sold 7,000 books. 
Last July only, we came close to selling 40,000. Lelo is now the top-selling bookstore in Portugal. I think the staircase fascinates people because of its curvilinear shape. It seems to have movement, and we have the feeling that by climbing the stairs, we're going to a magical place. And judging by all the smiles, no one here seems to disagree. Beautiful, beautiful bookstore. We're very happy that people enjoy the visit. To be able to keep this place as a bookstore that continues to sell books nowadays is really fantastic. It's fantastic. Well, those are all the stories we have for you on today's episode of Showcase. But don't forget that you can always visit our YouTube channel to watch more of our coverage of the global art scene. From me, Efnan Han, and the rest of the Showcase team, thanks for watching. See you next time.